Good morning, One Harbour Church. My name is Fricky, and I'm one of the pastors at the church. Um, this is the first sort of official Sunday where we're gathering in homes, very intentionally inviting families and friends to join us. And we have an opportunity to be the church. Oftentimes we say, uh, let's go to church, but technically we are the church. I want to remind you that through the centuries, Christians have gathered in many different places, in homes and in catacombs. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, he writes to the Corinthians saying, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So let's take this encouragement to heart. Let's uh, stand together as the worship starts. Let's turn the volume up of our voices, of the TV. And when we pray, let's participate. Let's all pray together. Let's pray for one another. Let's not just have one person pray who's possibly leading the group. And let's wholeheartedly step in and lean in to the, the sermon and, and the preaching. Um, so uh, talking about praying and, and, and leaning in and stepping in, let's do that right now as we build each other up in the faith. Father, I thank you for um, our homes. I thank you that where any two are gathered together, you are there as we worship you, as we pray together, as we listen to the preaching of your word. We ask you to build your church. And I pray, Lord, that we would be strengthened and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Higher than the mountains that I face. You are stronger than the power of the grave and constant in the trial and the change and what Jesus 
declaration today I will build my life and I Oh 
just thank you this morning that you are the firm foundation. You are the solid rock on which we stand. And while there seems to be chaos and, and discontent around us all the time, Lord, we just cling to you. We cling to your solid rock, your firm foundation, God. Thank you for the love and the peace that you bring. Amen. Hey, what's up, One Harbor? Uh, my name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here. And today I have an amazing opportunity to lead us into some intercessory prayer. And basically what this is, is this is our opportunity where we get to come before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and pray together on behalf of others. And so wherever you find yourself today by yourself or maybe you're gathered with some friends, I would encourage you over the next few minutes to actually pray together over these things. The first thing I want to pray for is I would love to pray for healing in our nation. Let's pray um, that God would heal our nation. We all long for those days, when, that day when Jesus returns and he comes and he makes every wrong right. But until that moment, until that day, let's pray that God would heal our land. The second thing I wanna pray for is I wanna pray that God would bring peace and that God would bring unity that nobody else can. And then third thing I wanna pray for is I wanna pray for safety. Safety for those that are out there trying to keep the peace and then safety for those that are out there protesting. And let's pray to an end to the rioting and an end to the violence. So if you could join with me for the next five minutes, let's pray together.
Good morning, Beaufort. Feels so good to say that, and it's so encouraging to know that even though we can't be together this morning, we are spread out all across Beaufort at the same time, and we are gathering in small groups, we're worshiping together, we're praying for each other, hopefully we're encouraging one another, and, and I'm so glad that you're tuning in. I want to just shout out to some of the new groups that are gathering this week. Uh, I know Joanna Pittman, you are going to have some people over. Hope you guys are doing well. Jay and Crystal Majors, I think you guys are starting a group. Welcome. And a shout out to the Davis group. You guys have been gathering for several weeks, inviting people over. Just want to commend you as well. I wish I could say hey to all the groups that are gathering, but I think we've got about 20 or so just in Beaufort, and so that would take a little bit too much time. But thank you for doing that, for opening up your homes. I, I pray you're encouraged this morning. So we are looking at the book of Proverbs this morning, again, which is so practical for all of life. The, the wisdom of Proverbs is timeless, but also totally relevant to whatever situations we're going through. And the topic that we were scheduled to talk about this morning is pride. We were going to talk about pride. Uh, Proverbs has a lot to say about pride, but one of the things I love about the wisdom literature is how you can take it and apply it to so many of life's situations, right? You could take Proverbs wisdom on pride and apply it to your professional life, to your marriage, and that would help you enormously, but you could also apply it to the situation that we're going through right now as a country with protests happening in every single state over racial injustice. So yes, I, I am sticking to the topic of pride this morning, but I want to unapologetically apply this wisdom to the topic of race in our country. Uh, let me also mention that if you didn't have the chance to see Donnie's short video on racism that came out on social media this week, I encourage you to take some time to check that out as well. A really helpful challenge to us. But let me just start by reading a small sampling of what Proverbs has to say about pride. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to, defy, the, the, than to divide the spoil with the proud. The Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. This is God's word. One of the amazing things about Proverbs that we've already mentioned is how Proverbs describes the way that God made the universe. It's telling us how to live in this world in line with the grain of the universe that God made. So to go against the wisdom of Proverbs is not just to disobey God in general. It is to really defy the way that the world is. Um, one example is, you know, around here we have a lot of shoals and sandbars, and there are signs for when you're uh, driving in a boat that you have to heed, right? The rule is red, right, return. And if you follow that rule with the signs, then hopefully you'll miss all the sandbars. But if you were to defy that and say, you know what, you can't tell me what to do. I'm not a part of your system. This is a free country, man. Well, that's not just bad because, hey, you're breaking the rules. That's bad because you're going to get your boat stuck, right? Right? And that's basically what Proverbs is saying. It's saying, hey, go ahead and see what happens if you don't listen to me. Here's what happens. It's not just naughty. No, you're going to ruin your life. You're going to drive your life right into the shoals of reality. You're gonna, it's going to come crashing down on you. And so we see this clearly when it comes to pride. Pride is not just wrong because it's bad, although it is morally bad. It also puts you at odds with the way that God made the world. When you refuse to turn away from your pride and step into humility, you're like a ship headed towards the rocks of reality. And Proverbs describes this in these passages we looked at in at least three ways. First of all, pride puts you at odds with other people. Secondly, it puts you at odds with yourself. And finally, it puts you at odds with God. So first of all, with other people, pride, pride destroys your relationships with others. Quite often in Proverbs, this language is used of having lofty eyes, which is kind of a strange thing to say. It's not something we really say, but this comes up a lot in Proverbs. It says, there are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. 
Um, now, this is actually a pretty easy expression for us to understand. We have a very similar one. We would say, you know, the idea of turning up your nose at people, right? But I actually prefer a Proverbs metaphor with the eyes because we know that looking at people in the eyes is a natural sign of respect. It's how you engage someone in front of you as a fellow human being. But the whole point of pride is that it makes it so you don't see the people right in front of you. You don't look at them in the eyes. You have lofty eyes lifted up. You know, when, when we tend to think about pride, we usually think that it only means thinking that you're better than other people, right? And that certainly is part of it. But most of us actually don't go around thinking, you know, I am so much better than everyone. But that doesn't mean that we don't deal with pride. Pride at its root is really self-absorption. It's not just thinking that you're better than others. It could be that it's just that you don't think about others at all. You're absorbed with yourself. Your eyes are lifted up from them. You're looking past people, not looking at people, thinking only of the goals that you have for yourself. And this ultimately does result in thinking less of others as well because because you can never consider life from other people's perspectives. And so you're naturally going to end up looking down on them. You're going to have a superiority complex towards them. Uh, The New Living Translation actually translates this verse this way. It says, uh, the lofty eyes verse, it says, they look proudly around, casting disdainful glances. Pride it, it naturally, when we're not thinking of others, we put others below ourselves and we end up looking disdainfully down at them. And, and that means we'll tend to think that the problems that other people are dealing with, it's really their own fault. It's what they had coming to them. We tend to think things like, well, something like that wouldn't happen to someone like me. So pride destroys relationships with others. Our lofty eyes don't see people. And one thing that that does is it makes sympathy impossible. But in contrast, humility, humility sympathizes with others. It doesn't look past people. It sees people. Now, right now, across this country, people are in pain. Uh, in just about every town all across this country, there are people entering into protest, often very peaceful protests. Sometimes some of these have become less than peaceful. But always, these things are born out of pain, specifically due to racial injustice in America. And I'm very curious What has been your response to that pain? Has it been the response of lofty eyes, disdainful glances, looking past people, or has it caused you to really see people and listen to them and learn? So much of what Proverbs has to say about pride deals with listening and having this posture of learning about someone else's story, assuming that you don't know everything and you might be wrong about some things that you think you know. Uh, Look what it says in Proverbs 15, it says, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. So one thing that I think we're seeing across the country is just how slow we are to listen and learn. Um, Something that's been remarkable to me during this pandemic is how many people all of a sudden are like self-proclaimed virology experts, right? Something that none of us knew anything about just a few short months ago. And now all of a sudden, everyone is so sure about everything. And we're also very quick to ignore anything that conflicts with what we've already decided is true. And I'm afraid that this exact same thing often happens when it comes to racism. And this is a really big problem because our pride in this area and our inability to learn has often led to serious hurt for our black and brown brothers and sisters. But let's just be really honest. Um, One Harbor is a pretty white church. It's a mostly white church. And most of you listening this morning are white. And that means it's our responsibility as whites in this country to learn about and to confront systemic racism. This is not something that our black and brown brothers can do for us. We have to enter into this as well, but it will take humility. Pride makes it really difficult for us to be quiet and listen and learn because pride assumes that we already know everything that that we need to know, but humility remembers, humility remembers that we actually don't know anything about what it feels like to have lived any other life besides our own. And the only way we find that out is by truly listening to someone else. 
You know, if we're talking about how pride hurts relationships specifically, you can find almost no better example than racism in the history of our country. Not just relationships between one person and one other person, but relationships between entire groups of people have been broken because of pride and superiority. Now, for some of us, a a really simple step for us to take today is to just acknowledge the reality of systemic racism that maybe you've denied, to open your eyes to the experiences of others. Let me briefly explain what I mean by systemic racism. When, When many of us think about racism, we think only about personal hatred in one person's heart for another person, right? For for someone of another race. And that is real and that is wrong, but that's not actually what systemic racism is. Systemic racism can actually be perpetrated by people who are full of nothing but love in their personal hearts for other races. Systemic racism is when the systems and structures of society in the way that we have built it have racist outcomes. And we should not be surprised that that continues to exist. After all, this continent that we call home had about 250 years of race-based slavery. That slavery system actually lasted longer than America has yet been in existence. Okay, And then when that was dismantled, it was actually followed by another 90 years of Jim Crow laws and separate but equal laws, which were in fact separate but were not in fact equal by any means. And that was the foundation, right? And we're only a few short generations from the end of that. So why would we be surprised that there would still be effects of that in society? Let me just give you a very local example. This deed is a a picture sent to me by one of our own church members um, from Live Oak Street. This is a deed from 1946. Uh, I live on Live Oak Street, so this is really local for me, right down the street from me. And the first restriction in this deed states this. It says that this house, the lands shall not be owned by any person of the Negro or African race or descent, nor be occupied by such except as a servant of the white person. Now, my understanding is that this was actually a very common restriction for housing covenants in downtown Beaufort. And that means that if you live in an older house in downtown Beaufort, it was very possibly the case in your own home. Now, I'm not exactly sure when these restrictions stopped being put into deeds, but I do know that here in Beaufort, we we have church members who actually graduated in Beaufort from a still segregated high school. This is not lifetimes ago, okay? Now, do you think that there could possibly be any lingering effects of those kinds of housing covenants in our community today still, in the way that our community and neighborhood is laid out, Uh, on the reasons for why people live where they live and the kinds of houses that they live in. Is it possible that these effects reverberate today? And there are evidences of this same kind of thing across society in every area. I actually deleted multiple examples of this from my sermon to shorten it. But just another example, black unemployment is twice as high as white unemployment. And even if you just look at black college graduates, they're still almost twice as likely to be unemployed as white college graduates. And study after study has shown that if you apply for a job, with a white sounding name, such as Emily or Greg, you are 50% more likely to get a call back than if you apply for that same job with a black sounding name, such as Jamal or Lakeisha. Even when these studies gave the black sounding name resumes more experience, the white name resumes still got more callbacks. When it comes to criminal justice, this is another area where we should not be surprised that our country's legacy of racism continues to affect those systems as well. You know, uh, out of every 100,000 Americans, about 700 are incarcerated. But out of every 100,000 black men, over 4,000 are incarcerated. There is not just one simple explanation or reason for that. But just consider this one example. When there was a heroin epidemic in the 70s and 80s, we called nationally for a war on drugs against the crackheads who were mainly black and poor, and they were incarcerated. Now we're in the middle of another heroin epidemic that has also hit the white community, but the public response has been much different. It's been to say, hey, these are people with an illness who need compassion and treatment, not just incarceration. And of course, I agree with that, and that's a good thing. But where was that attitude when it was mostly affecting black and brown people? Uh, Brian Stevenson 
is a renowned lawyer who has worked his whole life helping marginalized people who had been taken advantage of in the criminal justice system, being over-sentenced or mistreated. Um, in fact, the movie, some of you may have seen, called Just Mercy, it, an amazing movie. It's a true story of how he helped one innocent black man get free from death row for a crime that he did not commit. I, I really encourage you to, to watch it. It's a beautiful story. But Stevenson makes this point. that that current injustices are often rooted in the lingering effects of the narrative of white supremacy that has really infused our country. He says this, the whole narrative of white supremacy was created during the era of slavery. It was a necessary theory to make white Christian people feel comfortable with their ownership of other human beings. And we created a narrative of racial difference in this country to sustain slavery, and even people who didn't own slaves bought into that narrative. And our 13th Amendment never dealt with that narrative. It didn't talk about white supremacy. The Emancipation Proclamation doesn't discuss the ideology of white supremacy or the narrative of racial difference. So I don't believe slavery ended in 1865. I believe it just evolved. It turned into decades of racial hierarchy that was violently enforced from the end of Reconstruction until World War II through acts of racial terror. And so we are very confused when we start talking about race in this country because we think that things that are of the past, because we don't understand what these things really are, that narrative of racial difference that was created during slavery that resulted in terrorism and lynching that humiliated, belittled, and burdened African Americans throughout most of the 20th century, that same narrative of racial difference that got Eric Garner killed and got Tamir Rice killed, and you could also add Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd that got these thousands of others of African Americans wrongly accused, convicted, and condemned. Now, some of us, I understand, have had a really different experience than our black and brown brothers and sisters with the criminal justice system. Maybe you, you think, I, don't, I can't empathize with the way that they relate to law enforcement because I've never had a bad encounter with a cop. And, you know, despite only making up 13% of the United States population, black Americans are two and a half times more likely as white Americans to be killed by the police. And so they do have a different relationship at times, and we have to listen to that. You know, I spoke with Rosalind, who is a, a godly black woman in our church this week. She is a mother. She is a grandmother to black boys. And she told me a story this week about how her adult son was pulled over for no reason at all, treated rudely by an officer, and how that really shook him to his core. And when she heard about it, shook her to her core and worried her. And she told me about the fear and anxiety in the pit of her stomach this week for her boys, for her grandsons, how she actively worries about her sons and grandsons being shot by the police, something that I have never once worried about for my sons. Pride could easily cause us to not listen, to not see, and, and to miss that pain, and to fail to really take it seriously. But how on earth am I supposed to have a real relationship with Rosalind without being willing to empathize with her story? Now, there is some obvious sinful pride when it comes to race. The obvious pride is the pride that says, I'm better than you because I'm white, right? I think most of us would all agree that that is obviously wrong. But the more insidious pride that I think some of us need to deal with is simply the pride that causes us to not have eyes that see. You know, that, that, that some, we see somebody holding a sign that says, I can't breathe, and we think they don't really have real problems. They just need to get a job. That the pride that makes us think that we would never have problems like that, so there must be something wrong with them, right? Pride, what it does is it, it drains us of sympathy and it destroys relationships. When our uh, black and brown brothers and sisters declare black lives matter because, because they don't always feel like society thinks that their lives matter, and if we respond with, well, actually, all lives matter, that is a failure to sympathize. You know, I had a friend recently tell me that his mom was diagnosed with cancer in her lymph nodes, and he was reeling. He was struck by this. What if I had responded to him, you know, hey, actually, I don't know why you're all worked up about this. All cancer matters. You know, don't get too caught up on your mom's issue. That would have been an utter failure of sympathy. As a result of our failure to listen and enter in with that specific pain, Uh, The church of Jesus Christ is actually still one of the most segregated places in the country. White churches do not tend to be places where black folk expect that they will find sympathy and compassion. I want them so badly to be wrong. Uh, This point about pride, of course, I want to say it applies broadly beyond race. Christians should never have lofty eyes. We have to see the people in front of us. Um, If we don't, the result won't just be bad race relations. It'll be a whole train of broken relationships through our life, broken marriages, shattered friendships. 
And not only that, I also want to say that you could have the most detailed, you know, understanding of systemic racism and still be proud. You could have pride in being so much more woke and right on the issues and then look down on the people that are unenlightened. And that will also damage relationships. Humble people are able to enter into relationships with people they don't even agree with and still listen from them and learn from people that they might disagree with. Listen, even if you disagree with the protests, don't just yell about it. Go and ask questions of those protesting. Hear what has so bothered them. Really try to see them. Proverbs says that wisdom is found in the humility of opening your eyes to the people around you, letting their stories and needs come to the foreground, and allowing yourself to be challenged. But secondly, if we don't deal with the sin of pride, we won't just be at odds with others. We are also at odds with ourselves. Pride is self-destructive. Ultimately, if we don't reckon with our pride and embrace a spirit of humility, we will destroy ourselves. Proverbs says, 1532 says, whoever ignores instruction despises himself. Our culture is all about telling us to love ourselves. Well, according to Proverbs, the very best way to love yourself instead of despising yourself is to listen to reproof and correction. Allow yourself to be challenged. You know, at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian is repentance, right? Repentance, it means to change your mind and change your heart and change your life. And if you can't do that, if you can't repent, Jesus says you miss the kingdom of God. You miss God's grace and salvation. Well, one horrible thing about pride is it makes repentance totally impossible. Maybe the strongest verse on pride in all of the Proverbs says this, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Those are strong words, but it makes sense because if you can't own your mistakes, if you can't repent of your mistakes, if you don't learn from your mistakes, then you are doomed to continue to embrace those mistakes and repeat them, and you will ultimately destroy yourself in your blindness. All our excuses and the blame shifting that comes from pride is ultimately self-destructive. You know, when I think about stubborn pride that leads to destruction, I I can't get uh, Derek Chauvin's face out of my mind. Uh, Some of you watched the video of Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes, killing him. It is a difficult video to watch, but one thing that is absolutely remarkable and that so struck me in this video is how the bystanders are just pleading with Chauvin to get off of him, right? They're screaming at him desperately, get up, you're killing him. But Chauvin just gives them this smug look like he knows better. Like, who are you to tell me how to do my job? And he doubles down. He can't be convinced that he might actually be in the wrong. It's so bad that when you see Floyd visibly lose consciousness on camera and the bystanders, they just begin begging Chauvin, get off him and check his pulse. I think he's dead. He's not moving. Just check his pulse. And he still doesn't because to get up would be to admit that maybe he was wrong in the first place. It would be to admit that maybe he should have listened to them all along. And so, of course, his pride turns out to be destruction, not only for George Floyd, but ultimately also for himself. Now, it's easy to see it, In him, we have his smug face on video, but what ways do we do this? What ways do we double down to our own destruction? We persist in being wrongheaded because it is easier and less uncomfortable than just admitting that we have been wrong, admitting that we need help. That's a hard thing to do. So pride is self-destructive, but humility involves seeing yourself clearly. We said before that humility sees other people. It's not just self-obsessed, but humility also sees yourself clearly. Uh, Chauvin killed George Floyd because he refused to stop and interrogate his own actions and consider, you know what, maybe I am the one in the wrong. Over and over again, Proverbs tells us that we do not see ourselves clearly. The only way into wisdom is listening to the reproof and insight of others. And this is hard because it takes humility. But this is where every positive change you can make starts. It always begins with the release of pride, right? Coming out of addiction, Admitting that you have a problem, that you're an alcoholic, that you need help, that's hard. Changing patterns of behavior that maybe are damaging your marriage or your relationship with your children to say, actually, I'm bad at this and I need help. I need counseling. That's hard. Our very first moment of admitting that we're sinners in need of a savior, that takes humility. That's hard. And yes, for some of us, this step now of recognizing that, hey, if I'm a part of white majority culture, maybe I have some work and introspection to do in this area of race. It's hard. I want to just talk for a moment about this, um, this term, you know, this term white privilege has a lot of baggage, and I'm not going to try to force it on you. But if you are white like me, it is important to think about what it means for you to be a part of the majority culture, especially when there are many people around us that are not a part of the majority culture. 
Because when you are the majority culture, I consider you, think about this, you don't really think about culture at all. Like if somebody asks a fish, how's the water? The fish would say, what's water? He takes it for granted. It's invisible because we just assume it. Similarly, I heard a story about a white pastor. He was at his Indian friend's wedding and the wedding was colorful. There was music and dancing and and all this unique stuff that was hitting him. And he leaned over to his Indian friend and he just said, the white pastor said, wow, I'm jealous of you. You have such an amazing culture. He said, I wish I had a culture. And he thought he was saying something obvious and lighthearted, but his Indian friend got really serious and looked at him in the eyes and said, listen, man, you might be white, but don't let that lull you into thinking that you don't have a culture. In fact, white culture not only is real, but it's like the most dominant culture on the planet. Everything else that comes up against it, white culture tends to to dominate and win. So it would be a pretty good idea for you to learn a little bit about your own culture. It's bananas that you don't think that you have a culture, right? We don't always see it because whiteness is really the baseline norm in America. And the only way to know how it would feel to be on the outside of that culture is to listen to minorities and then actually believe them when they share their experiences. Oh, and let me just encourage you as well. Don't just look for the the handful of minorities that will uh, confirm your preconceived ideas, right? This is a common thing we do. Like 97% of black people are saying one thing, but we can find the 3% that are saying what we already believe that confirm all our priors and keep us comfortable, and we choose to just listen to them and share their videos. That would be a bad idea because that actually shields us from truth and from reality. It keeps us comfortable, but that's dangerous. You know, we're all aware that our country has a history of white supremacy. Nobody argues that that's in the history. It's obvious. But that history has affected the present. As a result of the history of white supremacy, many minority groups remain disadvantaged due to systemic racism. But here, here's the hard part to really reckon with. The hard pill for us to swallow is that not only does our country's history of white supremacy often leave minority groups disadvantaged, but as a white person of majority culture, that evil history actually gives me some advantages. And having those advantages alone does not make me a racist, but it is important to acknowledge these things so that we can steward the advantages that we have to lift other people up, right? Because if we don't do that, And if instead we shelter ourselves from reality, we refuse to embrace the humility that would help us to see, then we might be sowing the seeds of our own destruction. Our country will never be all that it could be. Our communities will never be what they could be until we reckon with these things. So I encourage you in this issue and in every other issue of your life, don't let the blindness of pride keep you from hearing hard things about yourself. You know, pride is easily offended. Our egos are so fragile and easily damaged, and we so often don't take criticism well. But to ignore correction, Proverbs says, is actually to despise yourself, to set yourself up for destruction. And ultimately, that's true because pride finally doesn't just put you at odds with others or with your own self-interest. Pride actually puts you at odds with God. The Proverbs paint this picture of a proud person as someone who's the enemy of God. It says in 16.5, everyone who's arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. And there's a reason for this, that you can't be on God's side if you don't love what God loves or do what God does. And God, over and over and over again in the Bible, is on the side of the humble, not the proud. And when I say humble, I don't just mean humble in your heart. I also mean humble in your circumstances. Humble in the sense that you lack power. Uh, You're marginal in some way. You feel overlooked. Look what Proverbs says about people like that. In Proverbs 15, 25, it says, the Lord tears down the houses of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. You know, in in a male dominated society, widows were really like the bottom of the food chain of power. They, they had none of it. If, in fact, in those days, if you were trying to come up with a mantra of social justice, like a little catchphrase to raise awareness to a major problem, you might have gone around saying, widows' lives matter, right? To raise awareness for that because they were often at the bottom of the food chain because they, they really didn't matter to the society around them, but they always mattered to God. Every life matters to God. But over and over again in the Bible, God especially draws near to those in humble circumstances. That's why God put himself on the side of the Hebrew slaves, not on the side of the Egyptian Pharaoh. And that's why when Jesus announced his kingdom and the blessings of his kingdom, he said, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger. 
Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the weak. Blessed are the meek. Proverbs puts it this way. It is better to be of a lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. There are moments in life where the proud divide the spoil. In other words, they gain more out of this life. By exalting yourself and pushing down other people, you can maybe squeeze more out of this life. But it is much better to be on the other side in the long run. It's much better to be on the side of the humble because that's the side that God says he's on. And we know this ultimately because at the very center of the Bible is God's great act of humility. Paul tells us in Philippians to have this mind among ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself from a place of ultimate privilege, equality with God, divinity, and he became a servant. He, when God came into this world, he didn't come as a privileged person. He didn't come as the dominant ethnic group. He didn't come as a Roman king. He came as a poor, marginal Jew, born to an unwed mother in a dirty stable. And God says, my place is with the humble. The gospel is an absolute assault on our attempts to inflate ourselves. Because if we want to join God and be where he is, our place has to be with the humble too. Pride puts us at odds with God, but humility actually leads to true glory. See, in the gospel, Jesus humbled himself to a stable. And more than that, Jesus humbled himself to a cross. You know, the cross, much like the lynching tree, was a method of shameful public execution reserved for the lowest of the low in society. It was a way not just to kill someone, but to dehumanize them and strip them of all dignity and say, this isn't even a person. But out of that total humiliation and identification with the most humble of all people came Jesus' ultimate glory of resurrection. This is the great paradox of humility, that if you truly want glory in God's eyes, the only real way to glory is not through pride, but through humility. Proverbs says this, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. This is the paradox of pride and humility. If you fight to stay on top, you end up at the bottom. But if you humble yourself, if you're lowly in spirit, you will be lifted up by God, you'll obtain honor. And that's how the gospel works. I want to just close by telling you that the gospel humbles us and glorifies us. The gospel tells us that we are all so messed up Right? We're so proud, we're so bent in on ourselves, so self-absorbed, so often exalting ourselves at the sake of others. We're so sinful that Jesus, in order to save us, needed to die. That's how bad our situation was, that Jesus died for us in humility. And you can only receive that gift of grace in humility. Now, there are some gifts that are insulting to receive. You're going to judge me for this, but my very first girlfriend, I did not know what I was doing. I was not a good person or a good boyfriend. And one time as a gift, I bought her like a frizzy hair serum, right? Like that's not a good gift because in order to receive that gift and say, thanks, you kind of have to admit that you have frizzy hair, right? It's like giving somebody mouthwash, like thanks, like what what is that, right? Well, the gospel is kind of like that. To receive the gospel as a gift, you have to admit some things about yourself, You're worse off than you'd like to admit. You're bad enough that it's beyond your own ability to fix. You need a savior and admitting that requires humility. But here's the thing, once you do that, you're free. Christians should be the most humble people. We should be the quickest to admit wrong and the slowest to hold on to bruised egos because at the cross, we already said that everything was wrong with us. We shouldn't be holding on and say, oh, no, I'm actually a good person. No, 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 it was so bad. Christ had to die. I'll repent again and again and again because I'm more sinful than I could imagine. I'm more proud than I thought. I'm less loving of others than I'd like to be. But God still loved me and Jesus gave himself for me. He died for me and that means I'm more loved than I could imagine. So I don't need to defend myself anymore and boost myself up. I'm free to confess. I'm free to listen to the correction of others, especially those who have had a different life experience than me. I'm free to keep on learning, keep on repenting. And in this posture of humility, there is wisdom. There's restored relationships with others. There's a clear view of ourselves. There's a restored relationship with God. So let us together, if we receive the gospel, let us receive this gift of humility. All the riches of the gospel are only received through a posture of humility saying, I need this and you gifted this to me in my point of need. I couldn't do this for myself. As we come to the communion table, we actually come together to both repent and to receive his grace. This communion meal, which I encourage you to take together, united with your brothers and sisters all across the county, this meal unites us 
by his broken body, which is the bread and this, this shed blood, which is this cup, it humbles us. There's no room to boast here. Jesus entered into our humble situation. He gave himself for us. And what that does is it makes us a humble people. We are desperate for him. And so let's receive his gift of grace in humility. Encountering this gospel should also change the way we relate to others. Maybe there's some repentance that you need to do. Why don't we pray for one another, that we be a community that is humble, that listens, that sees one another. Let's pray that our community experience reconciliation, not the pride that tears us apart. And then let's stand and let's just worship together because Jesus has been so good to us. I hear the Savior say, I stray. Child of weakness, watch Thine in me, thy oil Jesus paid it all All to him Sin had left a crimson stain But he washed it away Lord, now, Lord, now, indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the heavens You know the heart of Jesus, thank
song of thanks, our song of remembrance, our song of reminding our hearts that though we, the, the wicked, sinful ones, have a crimson stain, you, because of your efforts upon the cross, your yes to your Father to go, to take upon yourself our sin and our shame, you covered us, and you gave us hope, and you gave us life, you gave us a new record. We now are the free, we get to say thank you paying it all. We praise you for that today, Jesus. Guys, it is good once again to be with you. It's been an honor to, to worship with you and to pray with you and to turn our hearts back to the Word and to remember who we are in Christ Jesus today. We want to celebrate that even as we go now. So we want to remind our hearts that we have now six days to make disciples, to push back darkness, and to do it all the sake of the gospel, the very thing we just sang about. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your week.